Um, we sailed originally from um, Buenos Aires down to the Falklands. My pointer doesn't work for this, but never mind. Um, then on to South Georgia, and finally to the south, to the Antarctic Peninsula, and then back to Ushuaia on Tierra del Fuego. The Falklands were lovely. I mean, the thing is, if you travel that far, you really want to go and see as much as you can. And obviously, with Falklands being um, so much part of our recent history. Um, we wanted to include going to the Falklands and South Georgia. A lot of trips just go from Ushuaia to the Antarctic Peninsula and back, but we felt it was not that much extra cost and really were very interested in seeing what the Falkland Islands were like. We arrived on the most beautiful day on one of the outermost islands. I mean, it's Falklands are more British than Britain. Um, we had afternoon tea here with a wonderful spread of cakes, um, imported gorse, unfortunately. But what we come to see are the penguins. They have a lovely colony of what rock hopper penguins. And what was so nice was on the trip we were on, we had um, four or five different experts including naturalists, ornithologists, marine biologists who used to give us lectures when we were at sea. Um, we had a lot of time to actually sit and observe behaviours. Um, going early in the spring it we meant we saw the courting behaviours, nest building, but on the whole we didn't have the chicks which if you go later in the year you will tend to see. It's black-browed albatross, and then in the afternoon, we went on to another island. You could, everywhere you go, you do see um, the remnants of the whaling industry. Um, and in fact, on the Falklands, just everything has been abandoned. Gen 2 penguins. King penguins. They had a wonderful selection of penguins you can see in birds on the Falklands. And this is a king penguin with a chick. Originally, um, people thought that the chick was a different species because it really doesn't look like um, the king penguin at all. Um, the king penguins did have chicks because they have an 18 month breeding cycle. The other penguins, it's, it, it's a year. It's an upland goose, rather liked its tutu. More rock upper penguins. Rock upper penguins doing what they should do rock hopping. Um, this is an Antarctic shag with the most wonderful coloured eyes. Uh, it's also called a blue-eyed or an imperial shag. And this is a very rare bird. This is, there's only 50 pairs in the world. It's only found on the Falklands. And it's sort of their equivalent of a bird of prey, Caracara. The next day we went to Port Stanley. The weather wasn't as good. It was really quite windy, but it was a fascinating place. It's a wonderful natural harbour and what used to happen um, when boats were wrecked, um, damaged, going around um, the Cape, then they would limp into the Falklands to Port Stanley for repair and there was a lot of wrecks around the bay. Um, the SS Great Britain was here till it was taken back to Bristol. Um, when we were there there were still signs of the Falklands War um basically it's right for penguins they were light enough to walk over the beach here but you know it was was unexploded ordnance around in fact i think it's in the last week or two the falklands have now been declared free of mines still remnants um the second world war um protecting the harbor um this is the lady elizabeth which was um, damaged and then beached here and used various things for storage 
it's um it was and it was built in Sunderland so I, I put that in because I thought it was a local of relatively local interest and they still have the mizzen marsh of the SS Great Britain and that's it that's our boat in the background when you, when you go to somewhere like Antarctica or the Arctic, one thing you have to be actually very careful about is the size of the boat you go on. Um, in the Antarctic, you're only allowed to land if there's less than 100 people. So you can imagine these enormous cruise liners. You don't get off the boat. You, all you can see, I mean, the scenery is lovely, but we landed usually twice a day at various places. And if we didn't land, we went in sort of small boat Zodiac cruises, which hold about 10 people up bay to look at a glacier or something like that. Um, but on the big boats, obviously, you cannot do that. Um, the numbers able to land in the Arctic are even less. Some places we were limited to 16 people. This is Falkland Island thrush, again, an endemic species. And this is beautiful plant it's a, a gadgia um called they call it pale maiden it's the national plant of the falklands from um the falklands we went on to south georgia i this place is incredible realistically i think this was the most in the antarctic peninsula was beautiful but from point of view of interest south georgia has it all um, it, it was fascinating. We were accompanied by large numbers of birds flying past the boat and behind the boat. So most of the time, actually, um, friends and I and quite a few others spent sort of sitting in the back of the boat where it's relatively sheltered, watching various birds fly past. This is a wandering albatross. Um, when we, the weather were... <laughs> The weather was very changeable, I think is probably the best way of describing it. Um, and we did have some disgusting weather in, in South Georgia, but it was still absolutely, it was amazing sights. These little colonies of penguins in the tens of thousands. And what was interesting, they were as interested in us as we were in them. I um, mean, we, we were meant to keep, I think, about 10 metres away, but unfortunately, the penguins hadn't read the re regulations. Um, this is one of my favourite photographs because I really think it's lovely the way the um, penguin is sort of showing off and all the others are watching inquisitively by. We also saw sort of courting behaviour. The next place we went to, a place called Prion Island. We were lucky, we had the South Georgia officials going back to the base, their base on South Georgia on the boat, which meant we did get permission to land here. It's very limited time you can land here. There's a very good reason why. And that is because the wandering albatrosses nest here. This is a nearly full grown chick. You're only, it's only really probably the first few weeks of the season are you actually able to land and see them. This is an even rarer bird. This is a South Georgia pipit, which is only found in South Georgia and was, um, its range just limited to a few islands until recently. But South Georgia, like quite a lot of other places, has had a major campaign to eradicate rats. And they announced this last year that they have eradicated rats from all the from the mainland and all the islands. And the South Georgia pipit has now started to nest and extend its range. First seal. We one of the other advantages of going earlier was that we had much easier landings onto beaches. These are the first seals were gathering, was the best way of describing it. Um, on the beaches and later boats going around if they wanted to land would have to brave <laughs> a reception committee of fur seals which are really quite aggressive 
what was lovely was as well we were actually waiting for the um small boat to take us back to our main boat was i was watching these this pair build their nest um penguins are actually great thieves and it's a lovely story of a penguin nest by the post office on the Antarctic mainland where the um, rather wicked scientist replaced all the stones with blue glass beads, so blue glass stones. By the end of the season, every, ne every nest had blue glass pebbles in it because they'd been thieving from each other. So here's the nest being built. But it's just lovely to be able to watch that kind of thing. Um, I now understand why the Falklands War started with the scrap metal merchants from Argentina landing on South Georgia. Um, basically, the whalers just abandoned everything. It was far too expensive to take it away. So all the whaling equipment, boats, everything was just left. And this is a place called Stromness. Um, as we walked round, we had elephant seal pups. And we walked inland, we walked to a place called Shackleton's Waterfall. Um, if, I don't know if you remember the tale, the incredible um, expert Shackleton. He, he sailed from Elephant Island with five others in a very small um, row, rowing boat, really, um, to try and seek help um, for his party. And they went across through uncharted right across the width of the island of South Georgia to try and get help from the whalers and he slightly misjudged in the sense they came down in this valley and um, they needed to be in the next valley he, and they came down this fr this waterfall which at the time was frozen and they had to get to the next valley within the next day or so because the whalers were due to leave for the end of the season um, where they went to was Grit Vicar, which is now a museum. Uh, in fact, you can go online and actually have a tour around the museum um, site. They just, I got an email notifying me that it was now, you can now do a virtual tour of the place. Um, but you can see this is all totally abandoned. The whaling ships, uh, plus new inhabitants. Um, Again, you can see it was beautiful weather. Um, the church has been maintained and kept up to date um, and has sort of memorials to quite a few of the Arctic explorers, Antarctic explorers. But these are all the sort of remnants of whaling industry and the tanks which they um, rendered the blubber down stored and this is Shackleton's grave um, the tradition is to toast Shackleton and pour the remnants onto his grave I suspect that grave is highly inflammable at this point in time we were actually uh, traveling from uh, Buenos Aires to South Georgia about a hundred years to the day for the Shackleton ex edition and this is the boat the boat this is a replica of the boat that Shackleton sailed from Elephant Island to South Georgia and see the size of it incredible seamanship elephant seals on the beach the pups King penguins crossing a river. The penguins in this area, in fact, were molting, so they couldn't go to sea because at this point in time they were not waterproof. I don't think anybody could call an elephant seal beautiful. We were being inspected. And this is a bit further down, a place called Jason Harbour. You can just see the immense colonies of. Um, predominantly king penguins and then on the beach we've got mainly elephant seals one of the difficulties 
uh, one of the problems is because the whaling has upset the natural balance um, because sort of the whales um, with the amount of food they consumed meant there was less um, for, for things in the lower in the food chain so we have a, they have an explosion really of fur seals and elephant seals um, and there's a large number of males who are quite aggressive fighting for territories and harems. Went on from South Georgia to um, the Antarctic Peninsula. You can see we, we made eight landings or sort of sailings around. We were lucky we could just about got into the Weddell Sea. We were going towards one of Scott's huts, um, but the pack ice proved too great. A Weddell seal on one of the ice flows. Um, icebergs were often inhabited. These are Adelie penguins who need much colder conditions. There are concerns because of the Antarctic warming um, about their numbers and how well they will survive. Because see the scenery is spectacular. This is an uh, old Argentinian base where we landed, sort of walked around. It's very controlled where you can land, where you can go. But what is nice, as I said before, is just the opportunity to watch behaviours. I sat and watched these chin stack penguins probably for the best part of an hour. Uh, this bunch were courting. more imperial shags with gen 2 penguins this was incredible spot um we moored here overnight and i was out on deck early in the morning with a friend and we got sort of i mean sunrise we we got the sun lighting up this channel and it was flitting from sort of rock formation to rock formation. Absolutely amazing. And nobody else was there. Another landing. These are some Gen 2s. One of the most interesting places we went to was Deception Island. It's part of the South Shetland Islands and it's actually a volcanic um, caldera and at times this, this island had to be evacuated um, because of increasing volcanic activity. This was a British base and it was where the first flights from the Antarctic were made. You got, we actually were able to go into the hangar where they, they where the aircraft were. Um, the weather here was incredibly changeable. So got beautiful sunshine up above and then we get a store, snowstorm sweep through. Again, aban just abandoned boats. These are boats that used to take water and things out to the whaling boats. These are Cape Petrels. They used to follow the boat. They're rather nice ones but this, these, this pair were having rather a squabble. Half Moon Island. This is, this is an interesting island partly because I have seen other people's photographs of the Antarctic and um, of because it's such a distinct rock formation um, they obviously landed there and it was a muddy mess with penguins and penguin nests. We were um, the first boat the season at the majority of sites, which meant we got pristine snow. Um, 
one or two sites right at the end other people had landed it was actually horrible because it had frozen where they'd walked overnight and so and then fr some fresh snow and it was so it's really quite slippery this is a chin strap penguin taking a rock for its uh, nest P pornography <clears throat> Um, some interesting interactions. This was another time when we could just watch them. It was lovely. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful place, this one. This is another Argentinian base. You can see the beauty of a very bleak, probably nobody has ever walked there. This is now going back to Ushuaia along the Drake Passage. This is a Cape Petrel. We were very lucky. A storm had gone through a few days ago. Um, we had quite a bit of swell, but it was it really was relatively calm. Well, that's <laughs> That's the Antarctic. Well, why do we go to the Arctic? Well, we've got the gear. Um, we were a bit, I was a bit apprehensive. I mean, the Antarctic was absolutely spectacular. And I felt that, you know, as a comparison, you know, it was not going to be as good, but it's totally different. Um, the, we went originally round up to Svalbard, um, Spitsbergen on here. Um, which you can sort of see most of the way up, just slightly to the right. Uh, and th this is our where we travel. We, uh, we were there end of July, beginning of August. And um, so enough of the um, ice had melted. So we were able to travel round the, all the way around Spitsbergen. And we actually got quite a long way north more than 80 degrees north. This is Long Yerbjörn, um, which where everybody flies into, which is really a mining town. What's of interest is it's got the one of the world seed banks sort of is stored in the mine in the mountains. And it's not every day you have this as your warning sign. Um, in fact, it's quite a serious issue. Basically, if you once you're outside the boundaries of Long Avian, you have to have somebody with a gun. Um, we had to leave quite a few places early because polar bears had arrived. Um, we always had um, some of the crew um, with us with guns, and one or two places we couldn't land because there was a bear roaming around. We were very lucky we saw 13 polar bears, which is pretty good, considering most people usually only get a, a sort of couple of bears in the distance. But we were, there was only 50 passengers on this boat. It was, we were with an Australian company, Aurora, who we'd had recommended. And again, this is a natural history trip. And the aim is to see the wildlife. We spent one morning watching a polar bear hunt and miss on three occasions. It's not your sort of quick touristy trip round to get an idea of what it's like. It, it was, um, you know, we got the chance to, again to observe the natural behaviours. This is our boat, mm -hmm. which is a, was a Russian icebreaker. And we were heading north. Um, this is uh, Kungsbury. Fortunately, I couldn't get um, the type face to put up the correct um, various symbols for the various letters that are not in um, sort of in Norwegian. But anyway, um, the birds in the foreground, very small ones at this point, are black guillemots, which we actually do have um, in. We can see them in Oban Harbour where they nest. They're quite rare, but they they're around the coast of Scotland. Birds were 
I think it, it's probably because the depth of the fish are at, we saw very few birds really relative around the base of the glaciers because when ice falls in, it disturbs fish. Um, but compared to the Antarctic, where we were followed by hundred, you know, large numbers of birds, um, it's it was a totally different. There was a very limited number of species as well um, in the Arctic. It's just giving an idea. It was like we didn't always get good weather, but it didn't matter. Here's some black guillemots. One of the, my joys was we got the plants in. Um, the Arctic, which we didn't have in the Antarctic. Basically, beneath each of the bird cliffs, that little extra bit of nutrients made these sort of wonderful gardens with large numbers of different species, predominantly saxifrages. And what's very interesting, a lot of the plants we actually get in northern Scotland on the high on the mountains. But, you know, sort of things that are relatively common here, there are for instance, there's just six colonies on one boulder in Snowdonia, and that is all we have. There's a lovely one, I thought, black fleabane. And this is tufted saxifrage, which is the one which has six colonies in Snowdonia, which was everywhere. We got met at our first polar bears very quickly. Um, we were very lucky in that um, a dead sperm whale had been washed ashore. So there was a reliable place where you were likely to see polar bears. This, like um, the Antarctic, there are the various archeological sites from whaling. Whaling was in the 1600s here. They quickly exhausted the whale supplies. And so the archaeology sites are much older and much less remaining. This is an interesting site because this um, was where various expeditions had set off from, including um, an air balloon one towards the North Pole. And ju they just abandoned everything, all the equipment, the gas, um, the hangar where it was, just totally abandoned. There you go, bricks, British bricks like that. It's just give an idea of the scenery. Um, polar bear food. They like these bearded seals in particular. And this is why the hunt among, polar bears hunt among the ice flows. Walruses. This is a harem of females with a pup in the middle. I don't think anybody could call them beautiful. This is them swimming away. This is really in the, this is the northern pack ice. This is the furthest, you know, where we were really far north. This is a, a snow bow. So an ice bow. Um, this is formed by ice crystals rather than uh, rain. I couldn't get it all in. I hadn't got a wide enough angled lens, unfortunately. And this is what we used to see quite not reasonably often was polar bear. You'd see a head swimming, um, moving along through the ice flows, getting out, shaking itself and walking off. And sometimes they were more inquisitive. Um, these are Brunex guillemots. We went to a wonderful cliff uh, full of these guillemots. And they're just masses flying around, particularly in the evenings when they were coming back to their nest. The next morning, we had a very inquisitive polar bear. We had the chance to watch it leaping from flow to flow and occasionally swimming as well between them. Then he came over to have a look at us. These, this picture 
and the next one were quite difficult to take because it was so close. It was actually difficult to get it to fit in um, in the sort of viewfinder of my camera, particularly as the boat was moving. And this was the most beautiful morning in the far north. Stunningly clear. Um, this actually is the third biggest um, ice sheet in the world. Um, it's, it's North no, no, Slendert. And this is just waterfall coming off with the melt waters. But wonderful icebergs. Incredible. One of the things is that the Arctic, that you've got areas of what they call Arctic desert because basically they don't get any rain or any snow and incredibly bleak. Moving on, there's another bird cliff. This was a kittiwake cliff where there was a nest of kittiwakes. But below the kittiwakes, below all the bird cliffs, were Arctic foxes. Um, I did see Arctic foxes to other sites, but they were further away. These were much closer. This was a pair with two young cubs going into their den. Watching us. They really weren't particularly afraid of us because um, I think there's only four fur trappers left now on um, Svalbard. So they're left alone. Sadly, the reason the Arctic foxes there became was very evident. This kitty weight chick had fall, fell out of the nest while we were there. It was promptly grabbed, taken away, and taken up to a, um, a cache where, was, where they were storing food but you can see all the feathers I'm afraid lots of bits of bird wing and things of birds who met accidents and tried to fly onto the nests. Also a Svalbard reindeer these are smaller than the normal reindeer you see partly because um, there's not an awful lot for them to eat. The plants, just that tiny bit of extra nutrition from the whalebone was enough for this cerastium to survive. This is a trapper's hut. And the inside. Svalbard poppy, which is only found on Svalbard. You can see the incredible um, terrain it has to cope with. Walruses, these are all males. Large amount of grunting and climbing over each other and squabbling while we were there. Um, Another, this is Sarasium arcticum. It's quite an interesting plant because the, the plant book said that they thought this didn't flower. Um, but it might have been that the botanists weren't there in the right season. And just in this area, we did find quite a lot of it in flower. So it was rather nice and rather exciting. Um, this was a for fjord. We had a zodiac cruise, uh, partly because the, there was a bear where we were meant to land. just as we were travelling further around. Another, this, this, another old whaling site. But very bleak. But plants will survive anywhere. Um, what's very interesting, the plants in the middle of the whalebone um, is drooping saxifrage. Now, we have, I think it's three small colonies one is at the top of Ben Laws down a chim one of the chim sort of down a um, sort of chimney there you have to climb right 
down and it's about sort of two centimeters tall and you know if this flourish this plant was just flourishes on Svalbard so I'm going to end there because I think that's it's probably long enough rather than go on to greener but I think it gives you an idea of what a different place you know, how how different the places are but what incredible scenery and fascinating places they are